All right, so we're picking up where we left off last time. Uh, this is lecture 10, and our main topics are the bolzano weierstrass theorem and uh, the Cauchy criterion. So we had a to-do list last time, and we checked a couple items off the list. We showed that Cauchy sequences are bounded, and we defined the notion of subsequence and proved some basic uh, property about them, looked at some examples. And now uh, in this lecture, we're going to uh, show the other two items on the to-do list and uh, be clear about how that implies the Cauchy criterion. Uh, the Cauchy criterion just saying that convergence sequences and Cauchy sequences are the same thing. Okay, so the first thing we have to prove on our list is that uh, if we have a subsequence of a Cauchy sequence converging to some limit L, then the, sub then the original sequence also converges to that limit. Okay, so that's the first item on the list. And then we will state and prove the bolzano weierstrass theorem. Um, and once we have those things, we will uh, we'll conclude with the Cauchy criterion. Uh, and actually, before we do bolzano weierstrass there'll be a lemma in there. Okay, so that's, that's the plan for today uh, in this lecture. So let's work on the um, number three on that to-do list there. Okay, so the first item uh, is this theorem that uh, if we have a Cauchy sequence and a subsequence converges to some limit, the original sequence converges to that limit. Um, and just to have some short name for this theorem to, to be able to refer to it uh, concisely, I'm going to just, I made this up, I'll just call this the epidemic property. Uh, so if you have this sequence, subsequence of your sequence converging uh, in your Cauchy sequence, then this subsequence, the convergence of the subsequence sort of infects the whole sequence um, and forces convergence of the sequence as well. Okay, so, uh, so that's why I called it this epidemic property here. So let's give a proof of this. Okay, so we have a, um, a convergence uh, proof to do. So we will first begin by letting epsilon greater than zero be given. Okay, so as with any uh, theorem uh, that we're trying to prove, we should try to understand why the theorem intuitively is true, uh, and as much as possible, try to turn that understanding into a proof. So uh, here is our real number line, and let's say this is our limit L for our subsequence. So we have our subsequence converging to this limit. So let's see, we have, uh, we have a n, a n1, a n2, a n3, a n4, a n5, getting close to the limit, right? And and getting ever closer and closer as we go further out into the subsequence. Okay, so that's fine. We have the subsequence going to L. Uh, so what so what else do we know? What else, we also know that our sequence itself is Cauchy, right? And so what does that mean? So remember, Cauchy means that once you go out far enough in the sequence, right, all of the terms are bunched together, right? All of the terms are really close to each other. The entire tail of the sequence is kind of crammed in really tight, right? It's very claustrophobic in the tail of the sequence. So what we can think of here is if we uh, if we go far enough out with this subsequence, right, we go very far out into the subsequence. Well, if we're far out into the subsequence, we're far out into the sequence also, right? So imagine this, uh, this term here, just for argument's sake, is far out in the subsequence, so it's far out in the sequence. Well, if it's far out in the sequence, then because it's a Cauchy sequence, right, all of the terms in the tail after that point are all going to be crammed in together, right? So if I look at, let me see here. So if I look at this AN4, then everything in the original sequence, right, beyond AN4 is going to be crammed in close to AN4, right? So it's going to be, so like we're going to have some interval, right? AN5, uh, that's, that's after AN4. So that's going to be part of it. The whole sequence original sequence after an4 is going to be crammed into this interval right 
And then if we go out even further in the sequence, it, everything's going to be even tighter, right? Because as you go out further in the sequence, you know, right, because it's Cauchy for any epsilon that you're given, the tail is going to be crammed into there. Okay, so given any epsilon, no matter how small, you can always go out further in the sequence so that it's crammed in uh, even closer. So, you know, if you have, you know, you take AN6 here, which is way further out in the sequence, then the whole sequence is going to be crammed in even tighter. Uh, so let me get some variation in the color here. Right, so the whole sequence after AN6, right, should be crammed in that little interval uh, around AN6. And so you kind of see since everything in the original sequence is going to be close to the elements in the subsequence because it's Cauchy, right? So we know that, but also the elements in the subsequence are going to be getting close to L. So if I can just kind of schematically say this, basically the AN, those are close to the ANK, right? When N is large, so when N is large, and this is using the fact that, so since the sequence is Cauchy, I guess I'll say because, just sort of abbreviating, we're just writing down our ideas here, so not don't have to be too fancy. Uh, so because the sequence is Cauchy, and we know that because the subsequence is converging, the ANKs are going to be close to the limit, L, right, when uh, the when K is large. Okay, and this is just be by the convergence. So this is because A and K is converging to the limit L. And then we sort of have this, roughly speaking, have this transitivity. If the ANs are close to the elements of the uh, subsequence and the elements of the subsequence are getting close to the limit, then everything in the original sequence is getting close to the limit. Okay, so you can kind of imagine this, uh, you know, this subsequence sequence is walking out to the limit L and it's dragging the whole sequence along with it, right? There's this like, for each element of the subsequence, there's a kind of cloud around it, um, which contains the whole tail of the sequence beyond that point. So you have this, as you go out further in the subsequence, you have this cloud around there, which is containing the whole sequence. And that's getting, that, those little clouds are getting smaller and smaller, right? So the whole, uh, so each of the, so the center of the cloud is getting closer to L and the, the cloud around that subsequence point is getting is shrinking and getting smaller and smaller. Right? So those that whole cloud then is kind of uh, converging on L. Okay, so that's the intuitive picture uh, that we're just going to have to figure out how to write a precise proof of. But that should give you, I hope, a decent intuition for why this result is true. Okay, so now we have to figure out how we're going to organize the proof here. Uh, so ultimately, to show that a n converges to l, the last step we need, right? We need to look at a n minus l. We want that to be less than epsilon. And according to our idea here, the reason it's going to be less than epsilon is because a n is getting arbitrarily close to the a n k's, and the a n k's are getting arbitrarily close to l, right? So we have this intermediary of the a n k's. So we're going to, you know, our a n is going to be somewhere in this like orange interval, say, we're measuring the distance from that to l, we're going to first measure the distance to the, uh, to the blue, you know, a n k point, uh, sort of split it in the middle, that's his typical triangle inequality stuff. So we're going to say this is less than or equal to a n minus a n k uh, plus a n k minus l. Okay, so you're just inserting plus and minus a n k and then using the triangle inequality to split that there. And ultimately, we want this to be less than epsilon, right? So we're just going to make, um, so what we want is for this first thing to be less than epsilon over 2, say, and we want this second one to be less than epsilon over 2, and that in total then will be less than epsilon. Okay, so what we want is to somehow make uh, these quantities here less than epsilon over 2 each. And so let's see how we're going to do that. Well, where do each of these, where are each of these going to come from? Um, well, this, right, a n close to a n k, we decided that should happen because the sequence is Cauchy, right? So when you go, uh, when these n and n sub k are far enough out, you know, in a certain tail of the sequence, they're going to be arbitrarily close together by the Cauchy property. Okay, so this is uh, because uh, Cauchy, 
So that's that first one. And then the other one um, is because of the convergence. Okay, so, um, so A and K uh, is convergent. Okay, so those are the reasons. And let's just write down sort of what the Cauchy condition and the convergence condition are so we can stare at them and figure out how we're gonna organize things. So uh, the Cauchy condition, remember, is gonna say that there's an M, uh, so we have M and N uh, bigger than or equal to, so after some point in the sequence, and let's say N1, that's it. So ultimately, I want to be able to pick a capital N that this little n is bigger than or equal to, and that's going to be based on uh, this this one. So I'm going to call that N1 instead of just N. Um, and once we have that, that implies that A M minus A N, the tail is, is scrunched up. So we'll be able to make that less than epsilon over 2. Okay, so we'll be able to find a point in the sequence after which uh, these these things are crammed in uh, less than epsilon over two away. Okay, and also our subsequence is converging, right? The convergence of the subsequence. The subsequence index is k. So that means that there's going to be some big K, right? Such that when little k is bigger than or equal to the big K, that implies that the a n k are within epsilon over two of the limit. Okay, so basically the picture is like this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna redraw this. I don't think we need that anymore. Okay, so we have, right, okay, so, so we're trying to figure out how far out to take our a n. We definitely know that we want our n to be past this, uh, this capital N one point, right? Then the whole sequence, um, the whole sequence after that point is all crammed in to this less than epsilon over two thing, right? So we sort of have our, we have our element of our sequence, uh, so our a n, right? So if we take our little n bigger than or equal to that n one, we'd have our a n sitting here, and then there's this little interval around it. So we have a n plus epsilon over two. And then we have a n minus epsilon over two. And all we want is we want uh, this, right? So what we want is this a n k here, we want that to be one of these a m's, right? So what we want is our n k, one of the elements of our subsequence to, to be far enough out that it's past this n one point, right? So we want uh, our a n k guy to be one, to be, to fall into this interval here. Okay. So what we want is for a n k. So the a n, right? So you have your a n one, a n two, a n three, and then we want our a n k to eventually fall into there. And then we're going to know that this a n k as long as the little k is sufficiently large, right? So we need this nk to be large enough so that it's in this interval, so it's close enough to a n, but also so that it's close enough to l. Okay, so we kind of want, so we kind of have two conditions on this a n k. We need to be far enough out in the a n k sequence that it's close to this a n and also close to the limit. And then if it's close to both of them, then a n itself will be close to the limit. So basically, this big K here, right, we're going to want our little K bigger than or equal to that big K so that our A N K is close to the limit, right? So that we know that the limit is very close to this A N K point. And also we want N K big enough so that N K is bigger than or equal to N1 so that we guarantee that A N K and A N are close to each other. So what we want is a uh, is n k to be, you know, one of these m's here. So we want n k to be bigger than or equal to n one. And one way to do that is n k. Remember, we have a subsequence. We've gone out sort of k big steps. That's um, that's bigger than or equal to just k normal steps, right? Uh, so this is bigger than or equal to 
k, and so it suffice if we want n k to be bigger than or equal to n one. It suffices for k to be bigger than or equal to n one. Right. So we're going to just want uh, to take this a n k such that k is bigger than or equal to this big k and our big um, n one. Okay. So basically, what's going to happen here is when we set up the proof, we're going to say. All right, there's an n1 with this property, there's a big K with this property, and now take little k, which is uh, bigger than or equal to the maximum of big K and big N1, and, uh, and just let your, uh, your N be bigger than or equal to this big N1. So I guess actually, I guess we don't need, uh, we don't need the one here. We can just say, that we can just call that n. So that n, so this is this is going to be our n. We just need to make sure that we're choosing our uh, k appropriately to get the subsequence sort of uh, close enough to to a n and to the limit. Okay, so that's that's how the proof is going to go. So um, so then there is an n. So there is an n. such that m and n bigger than or equal to that n implies that a m minus a n is less than epsilon over 2. Okay, and there is a capital K such that and a big K such that little k bigger than or equal to big K implies that a n k is within epsilon over 2 of the limit. And I don't think we need this picture anymore. Okay, and now we just want to pick a particular uh, little k, so let's just, we'll, we'll just call it little k1. Uh, so choose little k1. Uh, we want that little k1, uh, we want that to be bigger than or equal to uh, n1 and bigger than or equal to big K, right? So choose k1 um, equal to the maximum of big K and big N1. So then the reason for that, uh, so K1, that's bigger than or equal to big K, so that means that A sub N K1 is within epsilon over 2 of the limit. Um, so, so K1, so little K1, that's bigger than or equal to big K yielding A sub N K1 minus the limit is less than epsilon over 2. And K1 is bigger than or equal to N1. Well, I guess let's just, you know, let's just say it. And n sub k1, that's bigger than or equal to k1, and k1 is bigger than or equal to n1. So we also have, well, that means our n sub k1, that's bigger than or equal to n1. Oh, sorry, I put in n1, but I didn't mean that because we just had n. Uh, so this, we don't need the 1. Uh, so we also have that the distance between a n k one and a n is less than epsilon over two when little n is bigger than or equal to big N. All right, so n sub k one is bigger than or equal to n. Uh, if little n is also then e bigger than or equal to big N, then by this condition here, the difference between them is going to be less than 
uh, epsilon in absolute value. Okay, so I think I can get rid of that. I can get rid of that as well, and we're ready to go. Uh, so putting this together then, putting this together, we find that if little n is bigger than or equal to big N, then the distance between a n and the limit is less than or equal to the distance between uh, a n and a n sub k1 plus a n sub k1 and limit. And we know that both of these are less than epsilon over 2. Right, so we just said uh, this is less than epsilon. This first one's less than epsilon over two, and um, and a n and yeah, and a n k one is within epsilon over two of the limit as well. So this is less than epsilon over two, plus epsilon over two, which equals epsilon. Okay, so just a little bit of maybe a little bit of struggle to figure out how to uh, to to write down the proof. Uh, to organize the proof, but hopefully the idea is basically clear. Uh, this subsequence is going to the limit, but because the subse because the sequence is Cauchy, the subsequence is sort of dragging the tail uh, of the whole sequence along with it to the limit. That's the basic picture that you should sort of absorb. Um, if you if you can absorb that picture and see how that relates to the the definitions, uh, then you're in good shape here. All right, so. Uh, Next order of business, before we get to the Bolzano-Weierstrass theorem proper, uh, this is a lemma which is going to pop up in the course of the proof, um, and it's just a useful thing to uh, to have, you know, to delineate separately. Um, and it's related to the nested interval property. It's kind of just the nested interval property plus uh, an extra little bit. So I'll just call this the uh, the nested interval, prop interval property two. Um, and it's just the same setup as the nested interval property. Uh, you have a bunch of nested closed intervals, um, but the additional bit is that the lengths of the intervals are going to zero. Okay, so if you look at the sequence of the lengths, they're converging to zero. Um, then the intersection is exactly one point. Okay, so the, the original nested interval, interval property tells us that uh, that an, a nested intersection like this is non-empty. Uh, the additional thing here is that if the length of the intervals is actually going to zero, right, which it doesn't have to in the original nested interval property, you know, you, you could just have your nested intervals could just be the same, you know, finite length interval uh, for every single one. So there's no reason it has to be, it has to be strictly shrinking. But if you really have a strictly shrinking to zero sequence of, um, of intervals, then you get a single point here as your intersection. Okay, so the intersection is non-empty by the nested interval property, but the shrinking to zero part implies there can only be one point in that intersection. So here's the proof. Uh, so by the nested interval property, the intersection of all of these things is non-empty. And then we just let x and y be elements of this intersection, and we'll show that x equals y. Uh, so let x and y be elements of the intersection. And what we're going to show is just that the distance between x and y is is arbitrarily small. Okay, so um, so let x and y be in the intersection, and also let epsilon be greater than zero be given. We're going to show that the absolute value of x minus y is less than epsilon. Okay, um, for any arbitrary epsilon, so that means x minus y must be zero. So let that and epsilon greater than zero be given. Okay, so the basic um, idea is, well, you're just going to take, right, so the distance between x and y, so x and y, they're in all of these i n's, right? It's in the intersection, so by definition, it's in all of the i n's, um, and so this is the interval from a n to b n, and so that means that the distance between x and y is going to be uh, less than or equal to just bn minus an. 
and that's cn, and we know the sequence is going to zero, right? So we just have to pick the n big enough uh, so that cn is less than epsilon. So um, so there is there is an n uh, such that when n is bigger than or equal to n, that implies, and I'll get rid of this other stuff, so that n, little n bigger than or equal to big N implies that uh, bn minus an is less than epsilon. Okay, and then, well, each of your x and y, so um, x, so x is between uh, a n and b n, right? And then negative y uh, is between negative b n and uh, and negative a n, right? So when you add these um, x minus y, that's less than b n minus a n, and this is bigger than or equal, uh, bigger than negative a n minus b n. So that means that absolute value x minus y is less than bn minus an. Um, wait a second, sorry, uh, this is, I messed this one up. So the sum of them, and then you pull the, this is minus uh, bn minus an, there we go. That's better. And so that says the absolute value is less than the length. Okay, so you can formally uh, justify that, that sort of intuitive fact there. Okay, so um, so the length is less than epsilon. Um, thus, if n is bigger than or equal to n, since x and y are in the intersection, We know that x and y are in i n, and so this is the n bigger than or equal to that n, which implies that the distance between x and y is less than b n minus a n, and we know that's less than epsilon. So since absolute value of x minus y is less than epsilon for all epsilon, greater than zero, x minus y must be equal to zero, i.e. x equals y, and so there's only one point in the intersection, right? So our two arbitrary points in the intersection, and it's and we found out that those two arbitrary points are equal. Uh, so the intersection is just equal to the one point x. Okay, so that is the proof of the lemma. And then that brings us to the bolzano weierstrass theorem. And so what the bolzano weierstrass theorem simply says is that a bounded sequence has to have a convergent subsequence. Okay, it's very simple. Now that we know what a subsequence is, you know, this is quite simple. So any bounded sequence, right? You, you know, bounded sequences don't have to converge. Uh, so you, you know, you have the sequence which is just alternating uh, one and negative one. Right? We know this is a divergent sequence, but of course, um, you know, just take every other term. That's just the constant sequence one. So that has so that's a convergent subsequence, and also you have this other convergent subsequence, negative one. And so bolzano weierstrass says that this sort of behavior is typical. So you, your bounded sequence, since you know it, it can only go so far, uh, there has to be some sort of structure to it in the sense that um, it has to kind of, yeah, it has to kind of either like repeat itself often enough that you have sequences like this, um, or it has to be, you know, have parts of it that are sort of concentrated on, uh, on one particular real number. Um, as a limit. So there's, so in a sense, you know, so, so basically kind of the, the intuition of the theorem is that, you know, your bounded uh, sequence, that means it has to fall in this interval uh, between negative m and m for some m. And 
there's only a finite amount of stuff here, but you have an infinite amount of things in the sequence. You have to keep placing, you sort of imagine placing the sequence uh, one at a time, right? A1, A2, A3, etc. cetera. Um, there's only so much distance you can keep between the sequence. You, you put A1, A2, you can keep them kind of far apart for a while, but eventually you, when you put it, put down a new term, it's gonna kind of have to be close to other terms, right? Um, and so there's, you can't keep them, you know, arbitrarily far, uh, apart from each other. And so there's going to be somewhere in this interval where they get like densely packed together. Um, and then if you sort of look at, you know, just read in order of the sequence and, you know, all of those things that are packed together, then that's going to have to converge to some limit. So roughly that's kind of the idea for why you would expect, uh, this, uh, this theorem to be true. And, more or less, I mean, that's kind of the idea that goes into the proof. Uh, so what you're going to, what we're going to do here is you take that, you take that bounded interval uh, from negative m to m. Um, yeah, if it's in this open interval, you know, open or closed doesn't matter for, for bounded, of course, they're the same, same thing. Um, and you're going to concentrate on, you know, the fact that you have an infinite amount of stuff uh, in the sequence that you're fitting into this interval. So the entire idea for the proof is you take this uh, initial interval where you have your sequence and you're going to just split it into two halves. So we know that there has to be an infinite amount of stuff on at least one side, right? So, um, you know, it could be an infinite amount of stuff on both sides. And let's say if that's the case, you know, we'll just take the, the left hand side. But maybe, you know, maybe there's a finite amount here and an infinite amount here, or a finite amount here and an infinite amount here. What there can't be is a finite amount here and a finite amount here because there's an infinite number of things in the total sequence, right? So, so then you sort of narrow down to, the, to this interval here and say, okay, I have an infinite amount of stuff here. And then in the next step, you split this in half. And you say, well, again, since there's an infinite amount of stuff here, I'm going to there has to be an infinite amount of stuff on at least, you know, one side here. So then you sort of narrow down to here. Say, aha, uh, there's an infinite amount of stuff in here. The next step, you know, there's got to be an infinite amount of stuff again on one half. And the next step, there's going to be an infinite amount of stuff in one half, right? And then you just keep doing this and you keep finding smaller and smaller, you know, portions of this interval where you have an infinite amount of your sequence. Uh, and so you're by that, uh, by this, by this method, you're going to be able to extract a subsequence, which converges. So you sort of have these, this nested sequence of intervals here. Okay. So we're going to end up using the nested interval property, which is going to, you know, converge down to a, uh, a single point because from that, from that lemma, right? These are shrinking by a factor of one half, so their lengths are going to zero. Uh, so there's gonna be some limit in here and we have an infinite number of things in the sequence um, in these intervals. So we're gonna be able to make up a subsequence that converges to that, uh, that limiting thing that's in the intersection of all these nested intervals. All right, so that's the basic strategy of the proof is you, you know, you sort of divide and conquer um, and you sort of divide, divide again, divide forever and conquer, uh, finding, a, finding a limit and um, creating an appropriate subsequence. Okay, so all we have to do is kind of write down what this idea is and then check a couple details. All right, so the proof is, um, so since our sequence is bounded, uh, so because the sequence is bounded, Because an is bounded, uh, the elements of the sequence are in some closed interval, negative m to m for some m greater than zero. Now, since there's an infinite number of uh, things in the sequence, well, I guess I should be a little bit uh, more careful about my language here. So there might not be a, an infinite number of things in the sequence in a certain way, right? Because again, if you go back to this uh, negative one, one sequence that bounces back and forth, right? There's really only two real numbers that are in this sequence. What I should say is there's an infinite number of um, indices n uh, such that a n um, you know, is in one of the halves of this, uh, of this interval here. 
So let's say this. So it is either the case, it is either the case that a sub n is in negative m to zero for infinitely many indices n, or a n is in zero m for infinitely many indices. Okay, I mean, it can't be that um, that you have only finitely many indices where it's in this and finitely many in this because that, you know, the whole sequence is in there. Um, and, you know, you know you have infinitely many indices in here total, so it can't be finite in both halves because then that would be finitely many total. So that, that doesn't, that wouldn't make any sense. So at least um, for one of these halves, there has to be infinitely many indices n where the ans are in there. So whichever it is, call this interval a1, b1. And let's say if it's both, uh, just choose the one on the left, I guess. Or you could always choose the one on the right. I don't know. Let's, we'll just go with the right, I guess. Um, if it's uh, if it's both just set a1 b1 equal to 0 M okay so we're going to be creating these intervals which are shrinking down uh, so that's going to give us a limit and we also want to create a subsequence as we go along right so uh, just just to begin the subsequence, just take anything which is in this interval, right? We know there's infinitely many things in here, so just take something uh, that's in there. Um, so, uh, so since uh, so since a n is in a one b one for infinitely many indices. Any indices, we have a sub n1 in the interval a1, b1 for some n1. Okay, so just randomly, you know, take any index you want as long as it, you know, the thing is falling in this interval, and that'll be our first, that'll be where we start our subsequence. So now what we do is just sort of iterate this process. So applying the same argument, applying the same argument to, let's see, we take a1, b1, we split it down the middle. Uh, so to the intervals, and we can get the middle by just taking the average of a1 and b1. So to the intervals a1, a1 plus b1 over 2, and a1 plus b1 over 2, b1, uh, we get a, we get a second interval. And so one of these two intervals has to have um, infinitely many indices of the sequence you know, such that the element of the sequence is falling in there. And so we get a second interval, which we'll call a2, b2, uh, such that, such that a n is in a2, b2 for infinitely many n. So what we can do, since there's infinitely many n, right, there's only finitely many n from a 1 to n1, right? So that doesn't exhaust all of the n. So we can just, so there's got to be some n bigger than n1, uh, which, such that a n falls in here. Okay, so thus, there is an n2, which is bigger than n1, such that, 
a sub n2 falls in a2, b2. And so what we should also note, so note also that, so what we need to note here is that, well, we need to use the nested interval property, right? So just note that, you know, we subdivided our original interval. So whatever interval here of these two is a2, b2, it's contained in a1, b1. And also the length is half that, the length of um, a1, b1. Right, so the length of a1, b1 is m, so uh, the length of a2, b2 is going to be m over 2. Okay, so note also that, um, that we have a1, b1 containing a2, b2, and that the length of a2, uh, b2, so yeah, so just b2 minus a2 uh, is equal to m over 2. And of course, we can clearly, so we can clearly continue in this manner. To find, so what we have is an is n1 less than n2 less than n3 less than dot dot dot, such that, uh, so, so we have this increasing sequence of um, of natural numbers and intervals and intervals so we have a1 b1 containing a2 b2 containing a3 b3 containing dot 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 such that the a sub n sub i are in a i b i and oh you know I just realized something uh, my sequence so my intervals are uh, the left endpoint of our intervals are are a sub n and the elements of our sequence is also a sub n so I might want to just fix this before the problem gets any worse. Uh, so here's, oh no. Uh, so, okay, I'm going to fix all the ANs and I'm going to make them XNs and then I'll come back. Okay, terribly sorry about that. I think I got them all, uh, changed all of the references to the sequence. The sequence is now called X sub N. Okay, um, so we're picking up here. So we have this incre increasing uh, sequence of natural numbers. Those are going to index our subsequence, uh, decreasing sequence of intervals, and um, the X sub N uh, I's are in A, I, B, I, and also the length of the intervals B, I minus A, I is equal to M over, uh, let's see, when we had two here, it's uh, it's just two to the one, you know, B3 minus A2, uh, A3, we're going to have another factor of two here, so that's going to be two to the two, so it's just off by one, so every time we have when we have bi minus ai, it's 2 to the i minus 1. Okay. All right, well, that's uh, that's more or less it, because now we apply the nested interval principle, or property. Uh, so by the NIP, and uh, so, yeah, so by NIP, well, I guess maybe we should say, because I really want to use NIP too, right? So note that... So note that um, m over 2 to the i minus 1, that clearly goes to 0. And if you want to be really sure about that, um, you know, it's easy to see that, uh, that j, you know, j is less than or equal to 2 to the j for any natural number j, right? Um, and you can easily prove that by induction. So, um, yeah, so this, this sequence, you know, the m over a power of 2 is going to be less than m over the, you know, just take the power. Uh, so this, well, actually, <laughs> kind of annoying. Um, so this m, m over 2i minus 1, that's going to be less than or equal to m over i minus 1, 
when i is at least two, okay, um, and clearly we can make this, uh, you know, this i minus one is as big as we want, so we can make this bigger than any multiple of m, uh, and we can make that arbitrarily, you know, so we can make that less than any epsilon, and so that goes to zero. Okay, so we know that, um, so by the nested interval principle part two, uh, we, we know that the intersection, uh, let's say k, yeah, so k equal uh, one to infinity of all these intervals, a k, b k, is equal to a one-point set for some x. And then all that remains, uh, so remember what we're trying to do here is just show that there's a subsequence that converges, right? So this, these x uh, and i's, there's gonna be our subsequence converging to this x. So we just need to show, um, so to finish the proof, the proof we show that x sub n sub k converges to this x. And that's pretty obvious um, that, you know, x is in all of these intervals uh, and the x and i are in those intervals, but those intervals are getting arbitrarily small, right? So the distance between x and x and k is less than or equal to uh, the length of this interval, which is m over 2 to the k minus 1. And, you know, as we said, you can make that arbitrarily close to 0. So we'll just, uh, we'll just run through that argument. Uh, so let epsilon greater than zero be given. Uh, and what we want is this uh, x and k minus x that's less than or equal to b k minus a k. That's equal to m over two to the k minus one. And this is less than or equal to m over k minus one, and I just want that to be less than this epsilon. And so I just have to take um, k big enough so that k minus one is uh, less than epsilon over m. Okay, so basically we just want k, you know, we want k to be bigger than um, epsilon over m. Oh, let's see. So whatever, just just solve that. Uh, so just solve this inequality. So we have one over k minus one less than epsilon over m, and so k minus one is bigger than epsilon or m over epsilon, and so k we want to be bigger than m over epsilon plus one. Okay, so that should do it. Okay, so I just should just need that last line there. Let epsilon greater than zero be given and choose, so choose big K such that big K is bigger than M over epsilon plus one then if little k is bigger than or equal to big K, we find that difference between the x and k's and x, that's less than or equal to b k minus a k, which is equal to m over two to the k minus one. And this is uh, less than or equal to m over two to the big K minus one. Um, that's less than or equal to m over big K minus 1, and big K minus 1 is bigger than m over epsilon, so this is less than m times epsilon over m.
and that's equal to epsilon. Okay, yeah, so that, uh, so that shows that we have convergence of our subsequence to that x, and that completes the proof of Bolzano-Weierstrass. Okay, so all we needed was the convergence of some subsequence, and we found it. All right, so that completes, uh, so we proved that uh, epidemic property of Cauchy sequences, and we proved the Bolzano-Weierstrass theorem. Uh, we had a little lemma in there, and now we just want to see uh, Cauchy's criterion, so the proof of Cauchy's criterion. So let's do that. So Cauchy's criterion... says that a sequence converges if and only if it's Cauchy. It's a Cauchy sequence. Okay, so the proof is, well, if the sequence converges, we showed last time that, that's, that it's Cauchy. Okay, so we already proved this. And in the backward direction, this is just going to be a consequence of all the results that we've discussed. Uh, so we have a Cauchy sequence, and what we want to do is use Bolzano-Weierstrass, which says that a bounded sequence has a convergent subsequence. Okay, so, well, we have a Cauchy sequence. Our Cauchy sequence is bounded? Yes, right? So we prove that Cauchy sequences are bounded. And so Cauchy sequence, a Cauchy sequence is bounded. So by bolzano weierstrass it has a convergent subsequence. By the epidemic property, By the epidemic property of Cauchy sequences, or I guess maybe I should just say, but, uh, but by the epidemic property of Cauchy sequences, the original sequence must converge to the same limit as the subsequence. And that is the entire proof. Okay, so we just needed the boundedness to be able to prove Bolzano-Weierstrass, and then the epidemic property so that the convergence of that subsequence can infect the entire sequence um, and, and cause it to converge as well. Okay, so I think I'm going to stop there. Uh, that's it for the lectures for this week. I know there was, you know, a number of new ideas introduced, uh, and I sort of I tried to lay it out uh, the best I can so that it was uh, that it was, you know, comprehensible. So try to take it all in, see if you can figure out how everything is is fitting together, and uh, we'll we'll reconvene in the next lecture next week.